WTOP Television 9. The big news at 6. This evening, the President addresses the United Nations for Drowan reports. Alan Grip reports as the Black Panthers are rebuffed a second time in seeking the D.C. Armory for their convention next month. And with the blessings of the governor for the first time in history, the Virginia NAACP convention opens in Alexandria. Gil Butler has the story. Warner Wolf on sports. And Charles Gertz with Radar Weather Watch. Now the big news with WTOP news correspondents Charles Crawford and Max Robinson. Good evening. President Nixon today told the United Nations that old power politics threaten a disastrous confrontation in the Middle East. And he called upon the Soviet Union to join the United States in peaceful competition to avoid war. WTOP White House correspondent Ford Rowan has the story. The president acknowledged the problems in Soviet-American relations, noting that they are at the heart of many of the world's and the UN's troubles. The president called for genuine progress in U.S.-USSR relations, saying it called for specific actions, not merely cordiality. He called for peaceful competition, not in the accumulation of arms, but in the dissemination of progress, not in the building of missiles, but in combating hunger and disease and misery around the world. The president stressed the need for Soviet help in avoiding a Mideast flare-up. Despite our many differences, the United States and the Soviet Union have managed ever since World War II to avoid direct conflicts. But history shows, as the tragic experience of World War I indicates, that great powers can be drawn into conflict without their intending it by wars between smaller nations. The Middle East is a place today where local rivalries are intense, where the vital interests of the United States and the Soviet Union are both involved. Quite obviously, the primary responsibility for achieving a peaceful settlement in the Middle East rests on the nations there themselves. But in this region in particular, it is imperative that the two major powers conduct themselves so as to strengthen the forces of peace rather than to strengthen the forces of war. It is essential that we in the Soviet Union join in efforts toward avoiding war in the Middle East and also toward developing a climate in which the nations of the Middle East will learn to live and let live. It is essential not only in the interest of the people of the Middle East themselves, but also because the alternative could be a confrontation with disastrous consequences for the Middle East, for our nations, and for the whole world. Therefore, we urge the continuation of the ceasefire and the creation of confidence in which peace efforts can go forward. In the world today, we are at a crossroads. We can follow the old way, playing the traditional game of international relations, but at ever-increasing risk. Everyone will lose no one will gain. Or we can take a new road. I invite the leaders of the Soviet Union to join us in taking that new road, to join in a peaceful competition, not in the accumulation of arms, but in the dissemination of progress, not in the building of missiles, but in waging a winning war against hunger and disease and human misery in our own countries and around the globe. The president also called again for a mutual ceasefire in South Vietnam, but he had no new proposals today. The speech contains suggestions that have been raised before, increased multilateral aid to poor nations, strengthened UN peacekeeping machinery, joint action to preserve the environment, international narcotics control, safeguards against hijackings and kidnappings. Despite the absence of headline-making innovations, the speech was designed to reduce Cold War tensions and increase Mr. Nixon's image as a peace seeker. Ford Rowan, WTOP News. Police in Santa Cruz today arrested a 24-year-old auto mechanic and charged him with the slaying of Dr. Victor Ota, his wife and two sons, and his secretary. Police arrested the suspect, John Frazier, less than a mile from the Ota home where the victims were found in a swimming pool Monday. All five had been shot once in the back of the head. Frazier was arrested at daybreak, just hours before the four members of the Ota family were buried. At 11.59 this morning, about 100 persons, including 60 priests, were worshiping inside the Catholic Church at San Juan, Texas. One minute later, they were frantically fleeing the flaming, crumbling sanctuary. The pilot of a single-engine private plane apparently had intentionally crashed his aircraft into the church, killing himself. No one inside the church was injured. 
The control tower operator at a nearby airport says the pilot called on an emergency frequency about 30 minutes earlier, demanding evacuation of all Methodist and Catholic churches in the lower Rio Grande Valley. At high noon, the plane struck and demolished the shrine, considered the outstanding Catholic church in South Texas. Black Panther leader Eldridge Cleaver today canceled the news conference which had been scheduled in Algiers. There was no explanation for the cancellation, but sources say the Algerian government ordered the news conference canceled. For the second time in 10 days, the Black Panther Party has been stopped by the courts in its attempt to use the D.C. Armory for a convention next month. Today's decision was handed down by District Court Judge Howard Corcoran following a 90-minute plea by Panther attorneys. WTOP News correspondent Alan Grip covered the session and has this report. Judge Corcoran first denied the Panthers' bid for a preliminary injunction against the D.C. Armory Board, which has refused the Panthers' use of the armory on the grounds that the National Guard might need the facility. Then George Corcoran dismissed the case outright, which means the U.S. District Court no longer has any jurisdiction in the proceedings. Panther attorney John Rigby immediately filed an appeal with the D.C. Court of Appeals. Rigby, a lawyer with the Washington firm of Arnold and Porter, which is representing the Panthers free of charge, built his case on the premise that the Panthers' First Amendment rights of free speech and assembly have been discriminated against. Rigby also charged that a Panther convention in the armory would not interfere with National Guard use of the building. But city government attorney Edward Curry, representing the armory board, said a Panther convention in Washington might result in civil disorder, that the guard might have to be called up, and that if so, the troops should have unrestricted use of the building. Curry said those considerations outweighed possible First Amendment discrimination. Judge Corcoran agreed and, in effect, sent the case to the appeals court. Security was tight inside and outside the building and the courtroom. Only one entrance to the building was open. Briefcases were searched. An electronic sensing device scanned everyone going into the courtroom, and then the doors were locked. Half a dozen U.S. Marshals and extra police were on hand. About 80 Panthers were advised in the courtroom by their leader, known as Big Man, to keep cool, and they did. So cool were they, in fact, that they politely but firmly declined comment after a decision was handed down. This is Alan Grip. A Virginia congressional race literally moves up, up, and away. That story in a moment. I really didn't believe it. All those claims that calm is the really extra dry antiperspirant just because it's a powder. So one day, I put it to the test. I sprayed calm on my left arm, a wet antiperspirant here. Then I took my facial sauna and turned up the heat. Which arm stays dry? The arm with calm. Believe it, calm, the really extra dry antiperspirant, really helps keep you dry. The most beautiful fountain in the world. The perfect test for the holding power of VO5 hairspray. Mary Ann uses VO5 with Mirol. Sharon uses another leading spray. Now on with the fountain. Look, Sharon's hair is down, but Mary Ann's hair is holding. Thanks to Mirol, the miraculous ingredient that holds beautifully naturally. Mirol makes the difference. VO5 with Mirol, now unscented too. Coffee a little bitter lately? The trouble might be in the pot. Stale coffee oils could be turning your coffee into a witch's brew, building up week after week in the parts you can't reach, like the spout, the stem. Now you can keep the witch out of the brew with Dip It, the coffee pot cleaner. Use Dip It once a week, and you'll have a good fresh cup of coffee every day. There are times when driving yourself is necessary. There are times when there's just no alternative to driving. And there are times to think about Greyhound. It's the only real way to see scenery. If scenery is on your mind, go straight with it. Straight to the heart of town. And you don't have to drive it or park it. So drive if you must. But when there's a choice, go Greyhound. And leave the driving to us. Throw away your timetable. Greyhound nonstop shuttle service, Washington to New York, leaves every hour on the hour, 8 a.m. to midnight. Downtown to downtown in three hours, 53 minutes. You get a seat for sure. Greyhound nonstop shuttle fare is only 10.10. Next trip, go Greyhound and leave the driving to us. 
This is a WTOP editorial. The issue which affects more Americans more directly than any other is being sidestepped by the administration in this election season. That issue is the economy. In January 1969, the new administration cautioned that it would take time to get runaway inflation, which the Democrats had left behind, under control. 21 months have passed, however, and inflation is still on the upswing. Consumer prices generally are 5% higher than a year ago. Figures released only this week by the government show prices rising at a disturbing rate of four-tenths of a percent each month. For the five and a half percent of the labor force, which is jobless, the economic squeeze has become an economic crunch. No reduction in unemployment is in sight. This is the gut issue this year. The administration's campaigners, including the president himself, haven't made clear what they intend to do about it. Instead, with a feverish intensity, many GOP warriors have tried to divert voter attention by trading in the issues of emotion. It's safe politically to be against campus bombers and street muggers because virtually all of us want an end to such crimes. But what's the right way out of our dollar dilemma? Are the right buttons being pushed? Is high unemployment to become a fact of life? These are issues of substance. To call for serious answers to these questions is not to suggest that the Nixon record is devoid of achievements. The president has scaled down the Vietnam War and has neutralized it as an issue. His strategies in the Mideast appear at this point to be productive. But Americans are preoccupied, and justly so, with what's happening to their pocketbooks. The president and the vice president, meanwhile, seem preoccupied with attacking dissenters on campus and in Congress. One would hope they would ease up long enough to deal forthrightly with the matter of the shrinking dollar. This has been a pre-recorded editorial. We encourage the presentation of contrasting points of view by responsible spokesmen. Darrell Stearns, a Democrat, is fighting an uphill battle in the 8th District of Virginia in his attempt to unseat Republican Congressman William Scott. Recently, Stearns ran out of campaign funds, but decided the sky is the limit. CBS News correspondent Barry Serafin unravels the riddle. Conjuring up images of the heyday of the barnstormers, a plane zooms away from a rural airport near Clinton, Maryland, every day that weather permits, to trail stern slogans through the sky. The aerial advertising is the result of an offer to charge the candidate nothing for the service if he loses, $15,000 if he wins. I was reading a paper one day and I saw Mr. Stearns was bankrupt. His campaign was bankrupt. So he needed help and I thought maybe we could help him and this is it. This is how we got involved. And maybe help your own business? Oh yes, we're always thinking about our business. How much do you actually stand to lose should your candidate lose? Well, it's hard to say, five, six thousand dollars, seven thousand dollars. Think you've got a good chance of collecting that fifteen thousand dollars? I'm betting on it. <laughs> Virginia's sprawling eighth district covers 20 counties and includes seashore, city, and farm areas. And different slogans are devised for different constituencies. They are all created by the men who string them together. And if they are sometimes corny, they look pretty good to a candidate unable to put his name before the voters any other way. plane means a lot to me. I haven't uh, had billboards. I haven't had any of the uh, normal advertising that a candidate would have. Uh, we haven't been able to afford it, and uh, this is great. It came at no cost uh, unless we win the election. If you win, how are you going to pay for this aerial advertising? I think we'll have a great victory party, and uh, we'll uh, get some contributions. Is it working, this aerial uh, advertising? difficult for me to tell, but uh, everywhere that I go, people seem to have seen it, so, uh, and I see it quite often myself, but I think it's working. Meanwhile, Virginia's Democratic U.S. Senate candidate, George Rawlings, got an official endorsement today from his party's national chairman, Lawrence O'Brien. They held a news conference in Roslyn, and WTOP news correspondent Alan Dessoff was there. O'Brien and Rawlings began by talking about one issue, the economy, 
with O'Brien reeling off figures to support his claim that the economy has deteriorated under the Nixon administration. But the talk quickly got around to a key political issue in the Virginia campaign, the question of how many Democrats will defect from the party and vote for the incumbent senator, Harry Flood Byrd, Jr., a former Democrat who was seeking re-election as an independent. O'Brien and Rawlings tried to play down the defections and got in some digs at the news media for allegedly trying to play them up. It's the general picture of Democrats working for Democrats, and the significant thing is the number of Democrats who have not defected, not the few that have defected. Uh, and this, this is the thing that happens, the news media play up the ones who have defected, but don't tell us about the 80 to 85 percent of the Democrats who are leadership that's sticking with the party. Well, I wouldn't fault the local media in that regard, Joy. I find that's the case. That's the case nationally. <laughs> we, well, have, we have an occasional defector, you yeah. know, uh, uh, in other states of this country, and immediately you will see these stories in the local newspapers and on television. Well, well here's Mr. Smith. He's not going to support the candidate yeah. of the party yeah. this year. In the meantime, the party can be 98.98 percent uh, unified, but no one notices that. Bad news makes news that's very right. often, when good news is uh, not. Uh, but on that very happy note at this earlier hour of the morning, I believe that I do see a unified Democratic Party in this state. I'm impressed, and I'm impressed in all aspects, with all aspects of this campaign. And I just suggest, George, that together we're marching forward because we cannot allow the uh, politics of fear to dominate this country. Right, I agree. Thank you very much. Thank you. The third candidate is the Republican, Ray Garland, who has expressed some concern about defectors for Byrd, too. Alan Dessoff, WTOP News. The U.S. District Court this afternoon overturned the district's one-year residency requirement to vote. Federal Judge Howard Corcoran ruled in favor of a suit filed by two couples who moved from New York to Washington last June. They claim it's unconstitutional to deny them a vote in the coming congressional delegate election simply because they have not lived here for more than a year. The election board says that if today's ruling is upheld by the appeals court, residency requirements would be cut to 30 days before an election. That's the cutoff date for registration. The running feud between Vice President Agnew and television newsmen heated up again recently when Agnew suggested that TV commentators might well be examined by officials in government to determine their bias. Commentator James Jackson Kilpatrick doesn't think it's a bad idea, as a matter of fact. He's volunteered to be questioned. It's time to put in another two cents worth, if I may, simply to keep the record straight on that ineffable household word, the Vice President of the United States. As our Lone Ranger high hose around the country, he continues to draw a vast deal of hostile fire, some of it well aimed, but much of it not. Mr. Agnew was out in Chicago on Tuesday to appear on Herb Cupsonet's television show. The next day, I happen to be in Mobile the next day, the Mobile Press Register carried a streamer head on page one to this effect. Agnew demands official examination of newsmen. The following night in Dallas, Senator Chuck Percy made a little speech and referred in passing to Mr. Agnew's proposal for what he described as an interrogation of reporters. The general impression was that the vice president proposes to haul us ink-stained wretches into his barbecue pits, there to be grilled like shish kebab. Well, now, this is what Mr. Agnew said. I had a letter the other day suggesting that it would be a big benefit to the public if some of the premier news commentators, such as the network commentators, were examined by a group of people in government to explore in depth your opinions, your prejudices, you have some, so that in the future the people who watch you would have a chance to know what underlying philosophy you have. Mr. Agnew went on carefully to emphasize that he was proposing nothing compulsory, and nothing, as he said, in a sense of demanding an examination. He was simply wondering aloud off the top of his head if it wouldn't be an interesting experience to let the people watch Eric Severide, for example, fielding a few tough questions. Well, in the name of common sense, I ask, what is so wrong with that fanciful proposition? What's there to make a flap about? I've had a crack at asking Mr. Agnew questions myself, and any time he wants to turn the tables around, he can have a crack at me. This is James J. Kilpatrick. In Fall River, Massachusetts, Senator Edward Kennedy earlier this week said he would be willing to debate Vice President Agnew on who has more effectively opposed crime, 
Senator Kennedy, who has been criticized by Mr. Agnew for his stand on law and order issues, charges the Nixon administration has shown little support for crime prevention programs. This afternoon, Post Newsweek stations invited the Vice President and Senator Kennedy to use the facilities at WTOP to debate the subject of crime and violence in the United States. In a telegram from James Snyder, Vice President of News for Post Newsweek stations, the Vice President and the Senator were offered a half hour of prime time prior to Election Day for the debate, which would be broadcast on WTOP and its sister stations in Miami and Jacksonville, Florida, and would be made available to any other television station which might desire to broadcast the program. Recapping the top stories on the big news, President Nixon has addressed the 25th anniversary session of the UN General Assembly. Mr. Nixon called on the Soviet Union to join the United States on a new road of peaceful competition. And police in Santa Cruz have arrested a suspect in the slaying of five persons earlier this week. 24-year-old John Frazier was captured less than a mile from the scene of the murder. Still to come on the big news, Charlie Gertz gives you a real look at the weather, and Werner Wolf tries again with his pro picks. Food shoppers, high costs got you down. Fight back. Shop discount A&P and save. Look at these famous name brands. Niblet's Golden Corn, five cans, one dollar. Tide XK Detergent, 84-ounce box, a dollar thirty-three. Save two on A&P's fresh chicken parts, whole legs with thighs, 49 cents a pound. Breasts with ribs, 59 cents a pound. Fight inflation. Save at discount A&P in the Washington area. Now, from Union Carbide comes a way to... Turn your horses loose, yeah, turn your horses loose. Introducing Stud, the tough oil treatment. Stud helps quiet your engine down as it sharpens performance up. Stud, if you're not satisfied it exceeds or equals the performance of the best-known oil treatment, write Union Carbide for your money back. Try Stud. Turn your horses loose, yeah. The Virginia NAACP opened its 35th state convention today in Alexandria. The first speaker was William Robertson, an assistant to Governor Linwood Holton. He said the Holton administration is making Virginia one society. After his speech, he talked with WTOP news correspondent Gil Butler. And we can say that we have had tremendous success. But this is all because the leader of the state, the governor, uh, recognizes this is behind it and at the same time the people of the state of Virginia we feel we're ready for this but they were looking for good leadership and the governor is exercising that type of leadership as a member of a Republican administration how do you feel about the, um, the candidacy of uh, Joel Broyhill and uh, William Scott uh, I'd rather not comment uh, uh, on any uh, uh, candidates uh, uh, race uh, this type thing my job is to win friends and influence people, and um, that's what it's all about as far as I'm concerned. How many um, members, for instance, of the uh, Virginia State tro Troopers are there who are black? Well, there is one member now, and uh, this young man came in under a former administration. But we feel that uh, by December 1st, we're going to have approximately five uh, additional young black men who will be on the Virginia State uh, Police Force. Now, this is a market uh, increase. Some people might say that this is not progress, but it is progress when we know that it took approximately uh, 300 and some years in order to get one, and then we come along in eight months, and we're able to place five. And next year, we'll place five or 10 more, and then 15 more, and then no longer will it be news, and that's the way that it should be. There were few young people at the convention, but State President Charles Brown said the young NAACP members are holding their own meeting in Richmond this week. Friday's funny football film and pro picks. That's the menu served up tonight by Warner Wolf. Warner? All right. First of all, the Senators picked up switch inning outfielder Richie Scheinblum today. Now, Scheinblum, 28, has always been a great AAA ball player, but he's bombed out every time he's been brought up to the majors by Cleveland. Last year, for example, Shine Bloom in Triple A ball at 337, 24 homers, 84 runs batted in. Let's hope that maybe Ted can show, show him something that he's doing wrong, and maybe we've got ourselves an outfielder. Baseball, by the way, set an all time record for attendance, pulling in 28 and one half million people last year. 16 and a half million by the National League and 12 by the American. One more word on Monday night's Mohammed Quarry fight. For the first time, a fight will be beamed live from the United States to the Soviet Union. 
The fight also will be shown in Europe, South America, and the Far East, which shows there certainly is still a market for boxing. Second round of the $150,000 Kaiser Open was rained out. Well, before we hit the pro picks, let's take a look at some of the plays you might have missed from last week. First of all, let's watch the Redskins' Sunday opponent, Cincinnati, on defense here against the Kansas City Chiefs. First play, Cincinnati on defense. Dawson throws to Freddie Arbana. See if you think he's still in bounds. What do you think? There's number 23, Coleman, and 27, Dyer. They say, no, ref, no. But it's a touchdown. Now, next play come out. The old end around with Cincinnati on defense. This is Frank Pitts. He ran the same play in the Super Bowl twice. And here it fakes Cincinnati. What if the Redskins are tied on? All right. Now, I've got to show you one more play. The Lions and Browns game. Bill Nelson goes back to pass for the Browns. And the pass is intercepted by six foot four, 250 pound defensive end, Larry Hand. And watch Nelson after the interception. Now Nelson does have bad knees, and there's old Hand lumbering down, but Nelson wants no part of him. Look at Nelson right there. <laughs> he kind of gives up there, doesn't he? He wants no part of him. All right, you're invited to watch the Kansas City Chiefs-Dallas game four o'clock here on Television 9 Sunday. And at three o'clock, an interesting show on the Bill Austin Show, our special guest, is NFL referee Bernie Ullman. All right, game of the week. First of all, it's got to be Monday night's game, the Vikings and the Rams. The name of the game is defense. The pick here is Minnesota over the Rams. Secondly, upset pick of the week. You know, there's two games caught my eye. The uh, Browns are three-point underdog against the uh, Miami club, and the Giants are four-point underdog against the Cardinals. I flipped the coin and came out with this one. This is my upset pick of the week, but keep in mind I've missed four straight upset picks in a row. All right. Finally, the Redskins and the Bengals. First bad news, Vince Premuto will be out for the season. We'll have a knee operation. All right. Let's hope it. Redskins 27, the Bengals 20. By the way, uh, don't forget WTOP Radio, as usual, will have the, all the college and pro football games, uh, the scores, every half hour, Saturday and Sunday quarter of and quarter past the hour. And finally, Gary Gabalich has broken the world's land speed record in his blue flame, get this, averaging 622 miles an hour. That's an automobile. You think about that. That's faster than the old World War II fighter planes. This is Warner Wolf. The Maryland Court of Appeals has overturned a lower court decision and said the Calvert Cliffs nuclear power plant on the Chesapeake Bay cannot be constructed without prior approval of the Public Service Commission. That poses a serious problem for the Baltimore Gas and Electric Company, which began construction more than two years ago. General Counsel for the Public Service Commission, Charles Ritchie, now says that any further work on the Calvert Cliffs plant by Baltimore Gas and Electric will be at the company's own risk. The company tells WTOP News it's preparing a statement in response to today's ruling for release later this evening. After somewhat depressing weather for the past few days, Charlie Gertz is promising a pleasant weekend. Thanks, Charlie. The weather has been a little depressing in the Washington area. Cloud cover very slow to move out, and this cloud cover is just to the west of us. It'll be moving on out through tonight, and we're going to go as far as to promise you a good day tomorrow. Let's check now by means of our radar weather watch just what is going on around the Washington area. A few light scattered showers, and they are very light, they are very scattered, are indicated by radar. All of the white areas, here comes the electronic pointer now up onto the screen to indicate where the weather areas are. The scattered light white areas around the scope are light rain showers, particularly up here on 70S going out of the city to the north. And again, an area I detected in the last sweep over to the east of Silver Spring, right through here, some very light showers. And then again, on down towards Suitland. This area just over where the intersection of 66 and the Beltway is, is a terrain, it is a hill. We have the radar elevation set high enough to clear the mountains that you would normally see out here and uh, pick up what weather there is. So we'll leave the radar now because there's uh, very little to show you on it. The current conditions at this hour in Washington, temperature 65, very balmy reading for this date in October. The humidity is high, 75%. The winds from the north-northwest at nine miles per hour. So there's considerable moisture in our atmosphere, and we can expect quite a bit of fog in the outlying areas tonight. The national weather map is getting more like a winter picture all the time. A severe storm way up off the British Columbia coast is bringing high winds, rather heavy rainfall to Washington and Oregon. 
working on down into Idaho and transferring, of course, over to snow through the Rocky Mountain areas. High pressure in the southwest with fine weather, and the next system that we'll look forward to in producing weather in the Washington area is a low developing rapidly in Oklahoma. Severe thunderstorms already in southern Texas, Louisiana, on up into the Missouri Valley with showers all the way up into Indiana. This low pressure system is destined to move north and eastward into northern Indiana by tomorrow, and then as it continues through the Great Lakes, some shower activity should move into Washington associated with this system, and this will occur on Sunday. But tomorrow's weather, right here, high pressure with fair conditions, these fair conditions extending back to the west, stations at uh, Beckley, Bluefield, out around Harrisonburg, Virginia, reporting just partly cloudy to clear skies. The train of lows off the Atlantic seaboard continues to manifest its influence along the immediate Atlantic coast just by uh, virtue of some cloudiness, a little drizzle, and fog. The heaviest precipitation now anywhere on the Atlantic coast is up north of New York City in New England. These uh, lows will continue on out into the open Atlantic, and the high pressure, the weak ridge of high pressure, will be moving on in for our area. The most significant thing in the weather for you to think about tonight if you're leaving the city is that there will be considerable fog, particularly on up north on 70S over the Pennsylvania Turnpike and back to the west in West Virginia and Virginia. Our fearless forecast then for the weekend. Tonight, just a few scattered light showers, extensive fog in the outlying areas, a low of 57 by dawn. Tomorrow, a sunny and warm day, 70 degrees. Scattered light showers under warm temperatures on Sunday, at least 73. I'll be back later in the big news. This is Charles Gertz. When people have headache pain and want an extra strength medicine, they know about Anison. Compared to the other extra strength tablet, even with its additives, twice as many people now use Anison. And Anison has twice as much of the pain reliever doctors recommend most. When you want fast relief of headache pain, get twice as much of the pain reliever doctors recommend most. Anison. Honey, the baby could catch your cold. Why don't you do something? I took some aspirin. Fine, but you need something to stop your cold from spreading. She needs Dristan Nasal Mist. Yes, Dristan Nasal Mist can help stop you from spreading your cold. Dristan Mist works directly in your nasal system, clears congestion that can make you sneeze, so helps sniffling and sneezing stay under control. Dristan Nasal Mist can help stop you from spreading your cold. Prodded by Senate District Committee Chairman Joseph Tidings, the district government last February set up the Narcotics Treatment Agency. It distributes the legal, inexpensive drug, methadone, to addicts as a substitute for the illegal and expensive drug, heroin. Senator Tidings and many others say they believe this will reduce crime by addicts in search of drug money. But the Narcotics Treatment Agency also grants money to community organizations to run addiction treatment programs, which may use methadone or other forms of treatment. Tonight, WTOP investigative reporter George Allen looks at one of these community treatment programs, one about the, which the narcotics agency changed its mind. It will be a treatment program for young addicts in Anacostia. It will be an abstinence program, no methadone or any other drug. Forty youngsters will be cared for at a time. The organization setting it up call themselves the Anacostia Rehabilitation Center. They heard the narcotics agency would give money for programs like theirs and ask for some. They say NTA promised them a grant and furthermore encouraged them to buy this $80,000 building. The program's movers are Dr. Charles Kaleo, head of Kayford's Hospital's emergency room, Reverend John Kinter, and Father Robert Flager of St. Teresa's Parish. If they would buy the building, the narcotics agency promised to make the mortgage payments. Thus encouraged, they dug into their savings and bought it. Then the narcotics agency turned around and decided to support a different neighborhood group one willing to run a methadone clinic. The question is, was NTA's commitment as firm as the priest and the doctor thought? It was rather firm because we received a letter from Dr. DuPont, uh, which was dated on July the 16th. And if I might read a few things, he said, I would like to inform you that the OEO grant has received approval from OEO and is in the mayor's office for signature of acceptance. I have received personal assurance that this grant will be accepted. The property at 1214 S Street here has been surveyed from a program stability standpoint and approved by W.L. Darrow, Chief Administrative Services Division, Health Services Administration, District of Columbia Government. This property is most desirable and there's no reason to feel that it cannot be properly utilized. 
there would be no problem in reaching an agreement about its occupancy pending working out some just minor details with the real estate division of the District of Columbia. And so to me, I mean, like, this is a real commitment as far as I was concerned, and this is why we went ahead, Dr. Kaleo, myself, and my pastor, Dr. Father Flager, went ahead and bought the building. Where did you get the money? <laughs> well, we had to use our own personal money. Um, I put out all my life savings, and Father Flager put out some of his, and Dr. Kaleo put out his. Did that letter play from uh, the Narcotics Treatment Agency play any part in getting a mortgage? You better believe it. <laughs> if it weren't for that, we wouldn't have gotten it. And that's the only reason why we wanted the building, for the rehabilitation center for the juveniles of this area. Well, Dr. Kaleo, where does the program go uh, now? What are you doing? Well, since we've been uh, sort of pushed aside by NTA, I think what we're going to try to do now is to make this thing work anyway. And we're going to do this with volunteers uh, and... Uh, uh, try to uh, have a program for the addicts in this area, especially the young ones, with the accent on abstinence rather than just methadone. How much is the building costing you in payments? The building is costing us approximately $1,000 a month uh, in uh, mortgage money and probably two or $300 a month in maintenance at this point. Where's the money coming from? The money is coming from the two or three individuals that purchased it the two fathers and myself at the present time. No grants, no foundation money, no help from anywhere? We have voluntary help in, in uh, keeping the building up and painting now from members of the community, and, and more and more are helping. Uh, thus far, there are absolutely no grants. But we are going to go ahead, and we're going to try to get a program going. Father Kinter, are you doing this on your own, or is your congregation helping you? No, this is strictly a, uh, a non-congregational effort as regards to money. Uh, it's just between myself my pastor and Dr. Kaleo. I really don't know how. I've had to, I've had to get a loan from my brother-in-law. And uh, I'll tell you the truth, man, I don't know where it's coming from next. Last month, NTA Director Robert DuPont wrote to Father Kinter, quote, we think this new arrangement will guarantee the best and quickest delivery of service to the drug dependents in Anacostia, end of quote. The priests and Dr. Kaleo now have a full-time counselor living in the building and they are in the process of choosing their first patients. They're looking for donations of money, food, furniture, equipment, and anything useful to young addicts trying to go straight. Is this program really necessary? Well, Dr. Kaleo, who has lived in Anacostia for 15 years, says he has increasing reports of children in Anacostia aged 10 and 11 who are using heroin. I'm George Allen. In August of 1969, federal and local authorities carried out one of the largest narcotic raids in the Washington area. The crackdown netted 55 suspects in what Attorney General John Mitchell called a mafia-connected operation. Since the raid, four of the suspects have been killed. WTOP News correspondent Mike Buchanan has a report. Officials today reported that three of the deaths appear unrelated to the narcotics case, but the fourth death the slaying of Charles Popeye Hales on Wednesday, as one officer put it, has all the earmarks of an old-fashioned hit. Seven key figures arrested in the sweep last year are currently standing trial. They're the first group of defendants in the case to go to court. Three of those now on trial are allegedly New York narcotic wholesalers related to a mafia family. Popeye Hales was killed as he left his Northeast Washington apartment Wednesday morning. A New Jersey man has been charged with murder. The U.S. Attorney's Office refuses any comment, but sources say Hales apparently was scheduled as a witness for the prosecution in the narcotics case. And less than 24 hours after Hales' murder, authorities arrested a defendant in the current trial, Lawrence Slippery Jackson, reportedly the largest drug wholesaler in the Washington area. Jackson had been free on bond, but was hit yesterday with counterfeiting charges. He's now being held on $250,000 bond. Sources indicate the arrest was made to keep Jackson off the streets and out of range. The counterfeiting indictment indicated that both Jackson and Hales were involved in using funny money for large-scale purchases of narcotics. And one authority speculated today on the operation saying it's a good idea when dealing with a mafia to use real money. One official in the Justice Department, when asked today about possible organized crime in the Washington area, replied, I certainly wouldn't say they're operating here. Perhaps you could say they're just visiting. 
This is Mike Buchanan, WTOP News. Here comes the Hanscom family's bake wagon, all the way from 1890, the year the Hanscom family started baking in Philadelphia. Back in 1890, Sarah Hanscom laid down the law, used the best milk, eggs, everything. And to this day, the Hanscom family keeps it that way. Only now they freeze it. Look for Hanscom in the freezer case in your supermarket. Hanscom eats good. Hello, everybody. I'm Kate Smith. I'm here to tell you about the greatest coffee I've ever tasted. New Chase and Sanborn with lively flavor bursts. Dark chunks of real coffee made a new way. See them? Real coffee with that rich, full-bodied flavor that only Chase and Sanborn gives you. Hmm. Take it from me, that's real perked flavor. Get new Chase and Sanborn with lively flavor bursts. I highly recommend it. Eight months ago, the Alexandria Community Health Center opened a live-in therapeutic community for drug addicts. It was the first of three such programs now operating in the Washington area. The Alexandria community is called Second Genesis and is run by two ex-addicts who went through a similar program in New York. Treatment at Second Genesis is based on drug abstinence, hard work, and rigid discipline accompanied by stiff reprimands known as haircuts. Residents of Second Genesis are doing major renovations themselves on their old three-story brick house. But supervisors of the program say the most valuable treatment tool is the encounter. Here is WTOP reporter Jim Mitchie with the last in a three-part series on Second Genesis. You know, you're sitting up here, I know you uptight, you know, you're worried about the girl in the street or making it in the program or... The 16 oh, residents and two supervisors of Second Genesis at least three times a week join in what they call an encounter. Everyone is expected to challenge and criticize each other's behavior and attitude so that each sees himself as others see him. It's an opportunity for venting pent-up emotions, something not allowed during the workday. There is much profanity, something else not allowed except during encounter. No one is exempt, not even the director or the coordinator, the top-ranking resident who supervises the work of his fellow residents. So sicky as you are, man, I blame the sucker over here our Estapiris coordinator. Man, you keep allowing this crap to happen, and kids keep coming to you and telling you what's going on, and you take his word for it. Nothing's happening, and you just let him slide. You know what, George? He's going to slide right out the door, because when we come down on him, he won't be able to take it. You know how we're going to deal with this, George? We're going to make him, make him a coordinator and make you an expediter. Oh, and you know what? And he's going to learn how to function. That's the only way we're going to have to teach him. No, you just, no, none of that listening bull None of that listening bull You know what? Listen to what he's saying, George. Hey, George, stop. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hey, hold it a minute. Hold it a minute. You're going to deal with this man. You know what? Hold it, Jimmy. If you don't deal with this man, then it might happen just like Jimmy said. Just like Jimmy said. We might reverse the whole situation. You don't deal with this man, then it might happen just like Jimmy said. We might reverse the whole situation. We did this to you once before. Yeah, all right. So I took it there, man. Oh, oh, wait a minute. Do your job before you get to Jimmy or myself. We didn't know. I didn't know there had been three weeks this man had a haircut. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, oh, no, 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 good. No, 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 why did he get haircuts every day, George? He needs it. This 19-year-old was in and out of hospitals and jails over the past several years before being accepted into Second Genesis. Last January, he was at Western State Mental Hospital in Stanton, Virginia, trying to kick his $75 a day habit. He had, among other things, stolen from his affluent parents to support his habit. And at that time, he had all but given up hope. Once you've taken heroin and been addicted to it, you always have that craving for it. Do you have it now? Yes. What do you think should be done with it? I don't know. What can you do with a drug addict? But after spending the past several months in Second Genesis, changes in his appearance and attitude are startling. This time I believe I'll be able to make it. Uh, this program is doing something. I'm doing something in the program. This time now I'm finding out a little bit about myself. You know, not all of it I like, you know, but this I have to deal with, you know, I have to deal with myself so that I'll be able to go back out on the street and deal with life faith life, you know, without having to run. You've run away from this house twice already. What makes you think you're not going to do it again? 
Well, I wasn't really being honest with myself before. I wasn't being honest with the program. Now, uh, I really want to get clean and stay clean forever, you know. I want to be able to leave the streets for good, not be able to have to come back to this house, any other house, any other program again. I can be able to go out and do what I want to do without having to worry about drugs, anything like that. The supervisors of Second Genesis readily admit that the live-in therapeutic community is not the entire answer to the complex drug problem, that it doesn't work for every addict. But they do believe from past experience that about 85% of hardcore addicts who remain in such a program for more than six months can be cured permanently. This form of rehabilitation, we're working dealing mainly with the hardcore addict, that is the heroin user. And I am thoroughly convinced this is the only way to deal with a heroin addict. However, we are, in the future, we are looking into uh, prevention, which will be dealing with the, what they term the drug abuser, the experimenter. And that's on a, more or less on a nine to five basis, where we were setting up our storefront here in the house. But uh, as far as dealing with the heroin addict, yes, I believe this firmly. Occasionally, a resident will run away from Second Genesis because of the program's incessant demands, but usually they'll return for more, believing that it's probably their last chance for survival. All admit they can only worry about getting through one day at a time. I can't predict the future, but I'm going to sure try. Hope for the best. you got to kind of set a goal, man. This is what I want to do. If you, don't, if you don't set any goals, then you don't really have anything to strive for, do you? Treatment of drug addicts in a therapeutic community like Second Genesis is expensive compared to other programs. The cost is about $5,400 per resident for the average 18-month stay. But officials at the Alexandria Community Mental Health Center now believe the expense is well worth it and more when compared to the alternative price of human suffering, a hideous price still being paid by most drug addicts, their families, and society as a whole. All 16 residents at Second Genesis believe there should be many more such programs in the D.C. area so that more young people like themselves can have a second beginning. This is Jim Mitchie, WTOP News. Come on, people now. Smile on your brother. Everybody get together. Try to love one another right now. When you dip down in that cherry bowl, then you want that flavor to warm your soul. Pour it out, cherry. It's not exactly tame. Before you take anything for an upset stomach, here's something you should know. Of the three leading seltzers you could take, one contains aspirin, the other phenacetin. So if you have a variety of aches and pains, you could take one of them. But when you simply have an upset stomach, acid indigestion, heartburn, take pleasant tasting Brioski for effective relief. In blue bottle or convenient foil pack, Brioski, the instant seltzer for the stomach only. Come on, honey, look at Daddy. She's sure pretty. Will you get those colors in the prints? Oh, GAF color print film, I get exactly what I see in the viewer. Exactly? Exactly. Same baby blue in her eyes. <laughs> Same. Same blonde color in her hair. Same. Same chocolate ice cream on her dress. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, yes. GAF color print film. The color you see in the viewer is the color you'll see in the print. That thing talk? There's a little guy in Fuzz who talks and helps you learn about things. It's a GAF talking V-Mat. It's got 3D color picture and sound. Here, press the sound bar. At Mount Rushmore, you can see the world's largest statuary. That little guy sure is smart. 
with the GAF talking view master a kid learns while he plays. Maryland's Senator Charles Mack Mathias has proposed a four-point program to protect Maryland workers and industries against the effects of cutbacks in defense spending. WTOP Capitol Hill correspondent Carolyn Lewis has that story. The news conference was called to unveil the Mathias program for conversion from defense industries to peace, but the senator took time out to say he is disturbed by the divisive effect of Vice President Agnew's political speeches. And I think that it would be a very unhappy thing if we were to attempt to exclude people from this party. The Lincolnian tradition of the party is that we bring together all sorts of ideas and ideals so that we can meet the aspirations and the hopes of all the American people. And uh, I would oppose very strongly any attempt to purge or exclude or polarize in this fashion uh, the historic base of the Republican Party, which is from one end of the American social scene to the other. Mathias said the nation can expect a loss of nearly two million defense jobs by June 1971. And since Maryland ranks fifth among states which have defense-related jobs, conversion planning is as necessary for Maryland as drought insurance for a farmer. He said conversion in Maryland could well begin at the biological warfare facility at Fort Detrick. As far as Maryland is concerned, I'm first uh, urging the administration to redouble its efforts to convert the remarkable laboratory facilities at Fort Detrick to medical research use. These are the laboratories that were previously used for biological warfare, which has been renounced as a weapon by President Nixon. Have you explored whether this kind of legislation can get through the 92nd Congress? Well, we're going to try to get it through, Carolyn. Uh, I think there will be widespread uh, support. The conversion program, of course, is a refinement of some of the things that I've been doing for several years, uh, beginning with uh, what I must confess was an abortive effort to encourage the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency to undertake this as a major program. The, uh, the agency now tells me that they are much more interested today than they have been in the past, and they are making uh, progress. But I believe that we can no longer, I think we're beyond the point that we can leave the conversion effort to, to that agency and that it will have to be embodied in legislation. There is support in the Congress for this kind of legislation. Take the housing crisis, for example, which is one in which people interested in the urban problems, people interested in cities uh, and the decay of cities, uh, would find uh, that uh, perhaps uh, components of housing could be manufactured by previously uh, defense-oriented industries, uh, that, uh, that these housing components, uh, if uh, designed and engineered properly, could reduce the cost and the time involved in housing. Uh, that this could be one of the breakthroughs for which George Romney, as Secretary of Housing, has been seeking. Senator Mathias expects to introduce his bills during the lame duck session of the Senate that opens on November 16th. This is Carolyn Lewis. Political analyst William Hamilton is reporting this week on the results of a special WTOP survey of voter attitudes in Maryland. Tonight, Hamilton reports on the Agnew influence on the race for U.S. Senate. Vice President Spiro Agnew is much more popular in his home state of Maryland than he is nationwide. His popularity, however, may not be as helpful in the Maryland election as it may be elsewhere to Republican candidates. A recent Harris poll shows that nationally there is approximately an even split between those who like Agnew and those who do not. However, in Maryland, our Campaign 70 survey shows the vice president with a 2 to 1 positive rating. Those Maryland voters who dislike Agnew are now solidly supporting Democratic Senator Joseph Tiding. Among the anti-Agnew group, Tidings has an 8 to 1 lead over Republican Glenn Bell. Those who approve of the vice president, however, are not necessarily Bell voters. Over half of these pro-Agnew voters approve of Tidings' performance as senator. In fact, they split their votes evenly between Tidings and Bell. As reported earlier this week, Tidings led as of mid-October. He needed to pick up only a small number of the undecided votes to win. Since Agnew's popularity does not automatically translate into votes for Republican Bell, it will probably take more than a campaign visit 
from the vice president to overcome Tidings lead. This is Bill Hamilton. Next Tuesday night, Television 9 will broadcast a special two-and-a-half-hour program, Campaign 70, The Great Debates, a special report on the Maryland and Virginia campaign. Chuck? The executive director of the Federal Trade Commission says the agency is looking for possible antitrust violations by firms that issue credit cards. The FTC maintains it has some evidence that the rates credit card issuers charge retailers is negotiated and can vary according to the size and influence of the retailer. Now with today's report on the economy, Bob Dalton on business. Interesting story out of Commerce Department today. They released figures on new labor contracts settled, and they show that the average worker under these contracts had a 9% increase in pay as of now. The big four automakers are in the middle of another court suit. AMF Incorporated has filed triple damages against them, charging unlawful restraint of trade in auto anti-pollution equipment. They want $3 million tripled. Our slow economy has forced Conroy of San Antonio to discontinue the production of motor homes, those majestic wheeled vehicles. And in another case, TWA and Burroughs Corporation have filed cross suits against each other. TWA charging misrepresentation in automated passenger reservation system. They want $70 million. Burroughs in a cross suit from TWA wants $11.5 million. Wall Street today wasn't very much. 10.5 million shares traded, an average share up 17 cents. Dow Jones up 1.51, 759.38. American Stock Exchange volume, 2.8 million. Average share up 6 cents. Very slow week. Bob Dalton on business. Now for a last minute look at the weekend weather, here's Charlie Gert. The weekend weather is looking good, and we're going to look right now at some of the better features of our radar weather watch. We have many capabilities with the radar here at WTOP, and one of these is sector scan. What you have seen so far is a 360-degree scan, as I'm showing you with our electronic pointer. Normally, the beam would go all the way around the 100-mile range, which we're showing at this time. But with sector scan, we're scanning now an area of 90 degrees. If you look at the bearing marks out at the edge of your picture, you'll see that the radar azimuth goes down to 240 degrees and then turns clockwise up to 330 degrees. So if we were looking for heavy weather out in this particular sector, we could scan through here any period of time. These, of course, are the mountains out to the west of Washington and Virginia. And as the heavy weather approached, we could show it to you and plan any types of action that were required with heavy thunderstorms or uh, heavy rainfall moving in from this particular quadrant. Sector scan, of course, can be set uh, in any given area, either to the north or over to the east, depending on the direction the weather is coming from. John Douglas will be giving you radar weather watch throughout the weekend, and here is my fearless forecast. Just a few showers tonight and a low at dawn of 57. Tomorrow, a sunny and warm day, 70 degrees, continuing warm through Sunday with showers. This is Charles Gert. And a reminder to join us later tonight when David French and I will have a wrap-up of the day's events on the big news at 11. This is Charles Crawford. Next, the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite from New York. This is Max Robinson in Washington. Have a good weekend. Portions of this broadcast were recorded. Recently, we visited homeowners and builders all around the Washington area and asked them about gas heating. Here's what we heard. Well, we've been married 30 years and had gas heat for 29, and we found it to be most economical. Gas heat is much cheaper than any other heat that we've ever had, and I know because I pay the bills. You know, I like to cook, and I think cooking with gas is tremendous. The main thing that I like about the gas heating is the even temperature that's maintained throughout the house. We install gas heat in all our houses because it's economical for our homeowners and, frankly, people really like gas. Yes, nine out of ten new homes are heated with gas. People are finding out that gas heat costs about half what electric heat costs and serves you better. So when you're house hunting, make sure there's gas heat. You'll save about half on your heating bill with Washington Gas. Well, the cost of living went up again. If you've had enough,
then vote Royal Heart. Royal Heart. Paid for by Heart for Congress, Citizens Committee. Television 9.